2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, and give grief to you, or give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not obey, do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his only holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power, he may fulfil every good purpose of yours, and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our, of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus. Father, we pray that as Jenny comes in a moment to read your gospel and to speak to us, Lord, we pray that you would give her courage and confidence, Lord, that you would speak your word through her, to our hearts this morning. Amen. Good morning. This is a reading from Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he'd become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Jesus I wonder how many of you remember the little chorus I remember from being a child about now Zacchaeus was a very little man, and a very little man was he. He climbed up to a sycamore tree for the Saviour he wanted to see. Now when the Saviour came that way, he looked into the tree and said, Now Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm coming to your house for tea. How many of you remember that, I wonder? 
of course. And you know the rest of the story. Zacchaeus was so overwhelmed to have Jesus as his honoured guest that in gratitude he promised to pay back four times all the money he had cheated others out of and devote 50% of his income to helping those in need. It turned his life around. And here's the irony. Zacchaeus was small in stature, yet he stands tall in our memory because of his generosity and good works. And that's what I'd like to think about in this talk this morning. Those who stand tall are not necessarily big people, either in stature or worldly acclaim. That is to say, they're not necessarily the rich and famous. They stand tall because of their compassion and benevolence and willingness to give themselves in service to others. I'll give you some more examples in a moment, but first let's take a closer look at the story of Zacchaeus. Luke says he's not only a tax collector, but he was the chief tax collector for the region of Jericho. Think of him as a broker with other tax collectors reporting to him and, of course, giving him a sizeable cut of their money. Tax collectors were hated and despised in Jesus' day. So if the people hated tax collectors in general, they would have hated Zacchaeus even more. He was at the bottom of the food chain, socially speaking. Plus, he was short. Not only could he not see over the heads of the others when Jesus passed his way, the others would have made sure that he stayed at the back of the crowd. They weren't about to let this little pipsqueak worm his way in front of them. But that was all about to change. Desperate to see Jesus for himself, Zacchaeus ran ahead of the crowd, and small as he was, he managed to climb up in a tree, so that perched on a branch, he had a bird's eye view. By the way, did it ever bother you that he climbed a sycamore tree? I've often looked at those trees and wondered how such a little person managed to climb that. But recently, I discovered that sycamore trees in Israel had branches close to the ground, so they were much easier to climb. So problem solved. In my mind's eye, I can picture children sitting up in that tree alongside a Zacchaeus. Like him, they wouldn't be able to see over the crowd either. And they wanted to get a look, good look at Jesus too. And if I was right about the children, when Jesus walked up to the tree, he may have chuckled at the sight of this grown man sitting amongst the children. The chief tax collector at that. Just imagine that. The people in the crowd may have laughed as well. But their laughter soon stopped when Jesus announced that he was going to Zacchaeus' home for supper. This would have been a no-no to any self-respecting Jew because to go to someone's home and share a meal with them was to affirm that person as a brother or sister for whom you are willing to lay down your very life. To provide for and protect. If Zacchaeus went out on a limb to see Jesus, Jesus certainly went out on a limb to save Zacchaeus. And save him, he did. The outpouring of acceptance and love was transforming. No longer would Zacchaeus live out his life as a small-minded, selfish little person thinking only of himself. From this point on, he would live for others and use his power, position and great wealth to befriend the poor and the needy. And that's what makes him stand tall. Not what he got for himself, but what he was willing to give others. The pages of history are filled with biographies of successful men and women, but the ones we genuinely, genuinely look to and admire are those who use their success to benefit others and to make this world a better place in which to live. Who are some of the people who stand tall in your memory? Chances are, and don't ask me why this is, they're quite likely to be small in stature. Of course, the whole world stood in awe of Mother Teresa, 
in her little five foot frame, she did as much to transfer the world into the kingdom of God as any world leader. You may remember J. John, the inspiring, inspiring preacher. He preached at the grammar school some years ago and has been writing about other Christian heroes online recently. He was quite a short person too. One life that impacted me was that of Gladys Aylward, a remarkable missionary in China from 1932 to 1949. I watched the film in The Sixth Happiness many years ago and was touched by it. Gladys was born in North London in 1902 to a working class family and had only limited education. She was a small woman, only four foot ten inches in height, with a Cockney accent. She worked as a housemaid and after becoming a Christian was seized by a desire to share the gospel in China. She applied to the China Inland Mission and was accepted on a three month course to assess her suitability but she was rejected on the grounds that she would be unlikely to learn that difficult Chinese language and be unable to cope with life in the Far East. Gladys returned to domestic service, but she didn't give up. Her vision for China continued to prompt her. She eventually heard of an elderly missionary lady who required a companion, but she had no money or society to support her. Undaunted, Gladys took the train over land and finally got to her destination five years later. She was renowned for looking after orphans, particularly orphan girls, and championed their cause to stop their feet being bound. She protected over a hundred orphans during the war with Japan and brought them to safety. And more importantly, she spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to many people. Her life was full of virtues, courage, compassion and an extraordinary de determination. Three things strike me. Firstly, Gladys Aylward is a challenge to the complacent. She had a lifelong and unquenchable hunger to see men and women on the other side of the world come to Jesus. Today the church desperately needs people with her passion and zeal for people and the gospel. Secondly, Gladys is an example of faith to the hesitant. She didn't simply believe something about God. She had a faith that motivated her to face challenges, overcome obstacles, and achieve great things for God. May we ask the Holy Spirit to give us the power and courage to achieve great things for God. Thirdly, Gladys was, was and still is an encouragement to the discouraged. Gladys was a little woman who viewed herself as being ordinary. Nevertheless, she put her trust in God and he used her in an extraordinary way. Then we have Elizabeth Fry and her story of how a middle-aged lady, class lady was able to reform the appalling conditions under which prisoners were treated in Britain and in many other countries. Hers is a classic example of the way God can use unlikely people to extraordinary effect. Elizabeth Fry was born a Quaker and they wore plain clothing that made them instantly recognisable. They rejected violence in any form and believed everybody was equal before God and tried to ignore social rank. Unusually for that time, they believed that there should be equality between the sexes so that women often took leadership roles. Elizabeth was often ill and suffered from ill health throughout her life. But at the age of 17, she had a conversion experience and ever after was a woman who was committed to public and private prayer, to Bible reading and to preaching and to doing good to others. She visited the women's section of London's notorious New Great Prison and was horrified. The section, built for 60, but then containing 300, was crowded with women and children who wore rags, slept on straw, and suffered every kind of abuse. Quietly outraged, Elizabeth turned the next day with food and clothing, but crises in the family delayed her full involvement 
involvement in prison work until 1860. Helped by others, she began regular visiting, bringing in food, clothes and books. She created a prison school and began schemes in which inmates could do work and learn skills. She read the Bible to the women and with considerable effect preached to them. Seeking to give inmates dignity and self-respect, she involved them in decision making. Realising that the prison system was badly flawed, Elizabeth began to promote the idea that prisons should not simply be places of punishment, but places of rehabilitation. And she created a number of associations for prison reform. Gifted with intelligence, charm and a persuasive and persistent personality, Elizabeth campaigned endlessly for change. She encouraged prisons to adopt an ethos of kindness and sympathy, to recruit female officers and to protect women by separating them from men. The press nicknamed her the Angel of the Prisons. So Elizabeth had a sacrificial compassion. It's easy to praise social action at a dinner party or on social media, but Elizabeth was someone with comp who was compassionate. With her background, she would have struggled with everything about a prison, the squalor, the smell, the disease. Yet, echoing the cry she loved and followed, she told prisoners, I am come to serve you if you will allow me and service always means sacrifice. And it was sensitive too. She realised the danger of being condescending and humiliating to those in need. And th thirdly, it was a sensible compassion. It was realistic and practical. She encouraged the education and training of inmates so they could take up a trade when they were released. Elizabeth knew what she could do alone was limited. She used her personality, her social links and her influence to get others involved with her. And she relied on God to guide her. The results were that her labour outlived her. There are no shortages of scandals today, but I find myself wondering where is our indignation? Where is our compassion? May the examples of Canon J. John, Elizabeth Fry, Mother Teresa and Gladys Aylward inspire us today to do good works. Of course, you don't have to be a short person to stand tall. All you have to do is let go of your self-centeredness and put others first. That's what makes others stand out in our memory. Not their accomplishments, but their deeds of loving service. So we thank you, Lord, for these people and for others who work for you in obscurity. Thank you for the many ways they grace your life, for the ways in which God's Spirit enabled them to live for others, for the communion of saints in which we live, surrounded by those who have gone before us, and for the ways in which God is calling us, even now, to stand tall in faith, hope and love claiming us as his own by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and inviting us to lay down our lives for others in the glory of his name. We ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. So, if we turn to page seven, I'm going to affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father, to say together, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died and buried. He descended to the dead. And on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let's pray together. When I say, Lord, receive our praise, and could you respond with and hear our prayer? We pray for God's grace. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. Lord God, through your grace we are your people. Through your Son you have redeemed us. In your Spirit you have made us your own. We pray first for the Church, that we would serve you and the community of Thorpe Acre with love and kindness. No condescension, no pretense of being holier than thou, being better. That we might share our hearts with others by our words and actions. And that our hearts would respond to your love. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. We pray for this country. We pray for our new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Father, we pray for the challenges that lay ahead for him. Father, we pray that you would move in his life, that he would come to know you. And we pray for King Charles. And Father, we pray that you would work your purposes through him, Lord. And we pray for this world, and we ask you to bring healing and peace to the nations of this world, that we might all live in peace with one another. We pray for the Ukraine. We pray for Yemen. We pray for Iran, for Afghanistan, and if there are other places on your heart, please do take a moment to bring them before God. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick and those in need, for all those known to us who are struggling, who are finding life very difficult, for those within this congregation and within this community and within this land. Lord, we pray for your wisdom for all in leadership as they make decisions that have impacts on the poorest often and the, and the weakest. We pray for those known to each of us, those who have asked us to pray on the prayer list. Lord, we commit them to you. We pray for your healing. Bring your healing to our friends and our family, to our neighbours and our community. Make our wills eager to obey and our hands ready to heal. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for Tim and Andrea and for this community of Thorpe Acre. And Father, we pray for your wisdom for, for Tim and for Andrea, for this church, Lord, as we move forward. We pray for the ability to work together for good. We pray for the ongoing ministry in this building week by week. We pray for Toddler's Church as it resumes tomorrow. 
and for Thursday Club and for all the other different activities of the week. We pray that this place would be a light in the darkness. We pray for friendship and community development. Make our voices one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer and the collect. Glory of God, touch our lips with the fire of your spirit, that we may rejoice to sing your praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 